doing what are we doing today what's up um we're doing a bit more of quantum machine learning it's going to be one of those exploratory videos so i want to take a look at the playlists see what i did have before in the terms quantum do i have machine learning ml ai or quantum ml models quantum neural networks quantum kn and n do i have some quantum ai or get so generative adver, adver, GANs, generative adversarial networks i think they are called um those are pretty old though uh i think those are really old knn neural networks ml models uh basically building a quantum gun discriminator generator those are from July 2019. That's kind of really roughly when uh, just a month or two uh, after I started. And I'm sure those probably need a lot of revisiting KNN algorithm. Um, go away. So, um, what was I? It's the same video minute. Video minute video. Interesting. That's not that bad, I think. So the, my, the point is, I'm trying to basically let me just microphone. Yeah. So I'm, plan, I'm I'm trying to basically dive a bit more into quantum into quantum machine learning, not just for the sake of quantum machine learning, but also just to try to uh, explore a bit more about entanglement. So there's two things that I want to start in the next days. One thing is dive into quantum machine learning, and I've done TensorFlow before. I'm planning to do the MNIST classification and, and actually do all the other tutorials as well. And I'm planning to take a look at the paper uh, where they release, where uh, Google basically released and presents TensorFlow, because apparently there are other tutorials in there that are not in here. Mm. And then see what can we do. I'll just try to maybe, maybe just build something with it. I don't know. <clears throat> we'll see. So this is one thing, right? Um, and then we'll do probably some research on some exploration on quantum the quantum internet as well, uh, which um, basically, if I go to Twitter, there's this. Um, uh, come on, I got uh, explore quantum login. Does this work? That works, cool. So basically, um, so RDVII, Rod Van Meter. So he's got, um, he's basically working with his research group on, where's that? Here you go, some quantum internet simulation. Um, and basically entanglement and quantum networking is as far as I understand a key element. And so this means talking about entanglement, purifi purification and all this kind of stuff yeah, that I, I definitely want to explore. So, but this, this is not out there yet. Um, in the meantime, I also found these. Let's see if I can find it in my bookmarks. Exactly. So. You might have heard of TensorFlow, and yeah, so this, this, this was this uh, this big thread in here, where Penny Lane basically goes in and explains a bit about quantum machine learning and whatnot, and the tools that are available. And I was like, I I knew about them because I touched uh, some of the Xanadu stuff, but not not really the things that they have in Penny Lane in and of itself. And I wanted to explore this a little bit today. So let's see. Um, in contrast to TensorFlow Quantum, uh, but I'm going to be exploring both things at the same time, right? So let's see. Um, we've got a basically uh, machines libraries, TensorFlow. It's funny that they talk about TensorFlow. Um, features follow, follow the gradient, makes PyTorch and TensorFlow Quantum. Um, because I think that was basically the idea, so you can integrate that with TensorFlow. Um, and so, okay. Learn, play, code. Get started with Penny Lane using our Quick Start Guides. Learn how to develop a plugin and browse the full API. Tutorials to introduce the core QML concepts, including quantum nodes, optimization, and devices via easy to follow examples and learn, sit back and learn about the field of quantum machine learning, sport key concepts and view. So I almost feel like I want to get my hands dirty on first, but uh, let, let's open up all, those, all of these three and see what we have in there. Um, what is QML, key concepts, demos, videos, uh, and then some featured stuff in here. Quantum transfer learning, data re-uploading classifiers, 
Baron Plotoy and QNN's QML demos. So we've got some demos in here. Take a deeper dive into quantum machine learning by exploring cutting edge algorithms using the penny lane and near term quantum hardware. Basic tutorial qubit rotation, Gaussian transformation, plugins, and hybrid computation. I feel almost a bit lost. I, I wouldn't know where to start. Uh, ensemble, so much in there. And okay, so that's directly the penny lane documentation. Development, developer's guide, building a plugin, release notes. Okay, so that's probably two using penny lane, developing a into quantum circuits. And so but there's some okay, so but there's something in, in here. The keynote decorator. Uh, from Chasm, from Keyskit, from PyQuill, from Quill. So, using panel lane. Where do I, do I need to install anything? I guess I need to install that. At least that's what I would expect. I can go up here. Introduction. Building the classical and quantum moral. More details. Interfaces. Okay, so that's just a guide. Templates. In order to large scale composable. Let's start with something a bit more tangible. Uh, one of those things, I start with this basic to our rotation. So that's our actual tutorial. I'm going through tutorials, import penny lane and numpy. Okay, but I got, I got to install penny lane, right? Creating a device, constructing a Q node, calculating quantum gradients, optimization. What are we trying to do though here? What are we trying to do with this? Uh, so let's use a construction optimization of quantum functions. Let's consider a simple case of a qubit rotation as a hello world example. The task at hand is to optimize two rotation gates in order to flip a single qubit from state zero to state one. Ah, okay, so you're basically training that to, to behave as a rotation, uh, as a zero to one rotation. Uh, then Gaussian transformation. Continues that's mixing a continuous variable of photonic devices for more details about photonic quantum computing. See the survey for documentation. That's a that's a, a big a big thing though. Constructing Q node. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at the QB rotation. I mean with TensorFlow, we did a uh, the first the Hello Many Worlds was a uh, the exercise was about error correcting, which is kind of not different from this one to to some extent, right? But this here this involves some actual physical, so some actual classical neural network that we were training to control those parameters. And here, let's see. It seems it it seems this could be a good example because it's pretty similar to. You want to have that rotation, so you want to train that to actually make that rotation happen. But then there's no. Well, okay, let's see. Let's see what 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 happens. So we're gonna need pi. We're gonna need numpy, which we have already. We're gonna need penny lane. So I'm gonna hit install. And let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Peep install. So let's see if that works. I'm not good at installing stuff, so but that seems to be that seems to be working. Okay. And now what about if we go to projects and we'll just make a another uh, folder for basically um but 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 uh penny lane and then we'll just do here a uh Jupyter notebook. We'll start a Jupyter notebook and play with it. Mm. So, is that installed? It seems like it's installed. I'm not sure if I need to install any of these in, uh, extensions. I don't think so. So we're going to close that. We're going to use... So we're going to focus on... Uh, um, <laughs> no. Penny Lane. Play. Code. Tutorials. This one. Exactly. Um, good. So to see panel or the transition from function, let's consider a simple case of a cube rotation. Uh, let's see if I can I zoom. Can I zoom in so you guys can read this better? Probably. Um, 
Okay, simple rotation. Quantum circuit is the following. Uh, so we've got rotation on the x-axis and the y-axis and then a measurement on the z-basis, I understand. Breaking this down step by step, we first start with the cube in the ground zero. Okay, we ignore this for now. Those are just, it's just the gate, the gate uh, matrices. And so here we've got the formula. And finally, we measure the expectation value of the Pauli operator. Ah, so you're measuring the expectation value. Um, why? Depending on the circuit parameters, the output expectation lies between 1 and minus 1. Yeah, that's all this mess in thing here. But why do we want to calculate the expectation value and why we can't? No, we just like output the results. Okay. Uh, okay, I guess the expectation value directly gives you the average result. So that enables us to calculate how, how good is our uh, optimization, probably. Um, import uh, can we do that screen by like side by side with a browser, or is it going to be too messy? So I'm gonna I'm gonna start a new Python three. I should buy myself a mouse. I think <laughs> import a Penny Lane as QML from Penny Lane import NumPy. As MP, that's that's coming from pen. That's coming. That's coming within Penny Lane. Okay. Um, important. We're starting the hybrid chronicles. Penny Lane is important. Also important NumPy for Penny Lane. Not. Okay. By importing the wrapped version of NumPy provided Penny Lane, you can combine the power of NumPy with Penny Lane. Continue to use the classical NumPy functions and arrays you know and love. Combine quantum functions ev evaluated on quantum hardware simulators and classical functions provided by NumPy. Okay, I'll open it to automatically calculate gradients of both classical and quantum functions. Okay, that's weird. So it's a wrapped up version of NumPy. So that's not that's not actual NumPy, it's something that wraps NumPy and provides some additional functionality. But everything else that NumPy offers is still there. That's 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 awkward. Anyway, creating a device. Um, before we can start a quantum node, we need uh, to initialize a device. Uh, let me quickly check. Is this re yeah, it's recording? So, define any computational object that can be applied quantum operations and return measurement is called a quantum device. So here we got devices in quantum in in TensorFlow. Uh, the, this seems seem to be uh, layers. What they call? Where they called? In penny lane, the device could be a hardware device such as the IBM QX4. Okay, or a software simulator, such so as strawberry fields, penny lane, SF. Penny lane supports devices with both QB model of quantum computation and devices using the CV model, uh, which is the continuous variable model. In fact, even a hybrid computation containing both is possible. Um, for this video, we're using QB model, so it's initialized to default QB. So, okay, so we're creating a device, a device def l, def l equals QML dot device. The dot device default default qubit wires equals one device. Okay, there we go. For all devices, device accepts the following arguments: name and wires. The name of the device to be loaded default qubit. We're using a qubit model. The qubit model. Okay. Here we are, we got a single qubit, so wires one. Constructing the Q node. Now that we have in, initialized our device, we can con begin to construct a quantum node or Q node. What are Q nodes? It's after an implementation of quantum function described by a quantum circuit. So Q node is a quantum circuit mm. that bound to a device, which is used to evaluate expectation variance values of the circuit. Because I have the Q node class, first we need to define the quantum function that will be evaluated in the Q node. So that quantum function is the circuit, right? Def circuit params, uh, and then we do QML, QML times uh, dot RX params, params zero, uh, wire wires zero, I guess it's the wire where this applies. QML RY, so this is basically the circuit that we uh, 
that we saw up in the beginning, right? Um, and we return QML, the expectation value, I guess that's it, exp val, val of QML of the Pauli Z operator. There's a lot of stuff in here that you should definitely, um, there's a lot of stuff in here that you, and, and you know, you have to unpack a lot of concepts if you don't know about expectation values and the expectation value of an operator and the operator being the thing that you're trying to measure and the expectation value being the value, the average value that this thing you're trying to measure gets, which is, you know, not a zero and a one, like you would see classically uh, when you measure any other stuff using something like the IBM Q experience, but that's something, that's the actual eigenvalue of that operator. So um, those are those characteristic um, outputs, like for the Z is one and minus one. And then the, and then each of those are mapped to zero and to the classical zero and ones uh, for, for, for the pure computational uh, uh, idea. But in here you stick with, you stick with that. So, okay, so we've got that. And then this is simple circuit matching the one described above. Uh, it's constructed with uh, Python function that accepts params uh, and those are the parameters that we will basically uh, yeah, give to the Rx and Ri rotations. Um, position R, uh, which may be a least tuple array and use individual elements to get parameters. Uh, however, quantum functions are a restricted subset of Python functions. For a Python function to also be a valid quantum function, there are some important restrictions. Quantum function must not only contain quantum operator, uh, quantum functions must only contain quantum operators one operation per line in the order in which they are to be applied. Initially, you must always specify the subsystem the operation applies to by passing the wires argument. How many wires the operation acts on? Okay, um, so this means this you always must be, must give in which wires this operation, yeah, whatever. Uh, Add a single or a tuple of measured observables. So you can measure multiple observables, okay. As a result, the quantum function always returns a classical quantity. Um, uh, uh, as a result, the quantum function always runs a classical quantity, allowing the Q not to interface with other classical functions. For a full list of observables, see the documentation. Let's see. Quantum operations observables. No. Uh, CV observables, CV, CV separation. Now we are interested in qubit observables. Hadamard, the Hadamard operator, Hadamard Hermitian, an arbitrary Hermitian observable. Why arbitrary? Poly X, poly, poly Y, poly Z. I'm curious, why would you have the Hadamard as, as an observable? Hadamard as an observable. What is that? Why, why, why is that useful? <laughs> like, what is the difference between the Hadamard being an observable and using poly X, for example? Because if you're competing on the Z basis, then poly X literally means measure the x and that's something you usually do with apl by applying a Hadamard gate but what it, does it mean as observables yeah. Hadamard so from the z observable is just measure while the x observable was apply Hadamard then measure exactly that's what I meant um, but why Okay, so that's an interesting thing. Why can so what is the difference? Maybe I'll maybe I'll ask. So what is the difference of using the Hadamar of the Hadamar as an observable and the Pali X as an observable? That's a question. Hey quantum tweeter. Hey quantum tweeter. What's the difference of or what's the Hmm. What's the difference between between the Hadamard and the Pauli X? Oh, wait a second. Maybe this is because the Pauli X means apply an X gate. Ah, maybe that's the that's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm not gonna ask that. I'll just come across as stupid. <laughs> yeah, so that that's uh, that's taking a look at the 
uh, anyway, let's go on. Um, the this problem means apply a hot mark gate and then um, and then measure and apply an X gate and then measure. Yeah, and then that's like apply a Z gate, which does nothing to your to your uh, to your stuff. We're not. That's not true though. Hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Not in time. Not not one hundred percent sure. As a result, of quantum function. Uh, so, uh, so you can return multiple observables. Uh, quantum functions must not contain any classical processing of circuit parameters. Certain devices may only support a subset of available penny lane operations or observables. We may even provide additional operation observables. Please consult the documentation. Okay. So once we've created the quantum function, we convert it into a Q node running on device one by applying the Q node decorator. What? That's all. That's QML Q node. So, okay, so that basically annotation tells them the please the the following function is kind of coupled to the device one that we just ha uh, <laughs> I use def l sorry def one and def one okay uh, this is circuit this is a circuit quantum function is now a q node okay which will run on device one every time it's evaluated I mean that that way of building it is actually is actually pretty handy because you don't have to every time say I execute this uh, and then choose the device and then but it kind of binds it up one times yeah okay we'll see to evaluate we simply call the function with some numerical inputs okay ah so you call the function and that does everything so that builds the circuit and executes it, execute it, executes it in that device print a circuit um, and we'll give it a it says 54 0 0.12 uh, what type error print circuit circuit uh, what am I doing wrong what am I doing wrong mm -mm 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 -mm. QML wire A here. That's the problem. Wires. Okay. Here we go. Matches. Um, calculating quantum gra uh, gradients. So the gradient of the function circuit encapsulated within Q node can be evaluated by utilizing the same quantum device that we use to evaluate the function itself. Penny lane incorporates both analytic differentiation as well as numerical methods. Uh, both of these are done automatically. We can differentiate by using the built-in grad function. This returns another function representing the gradient, the vector of partial der uh, derivatives of circuit. Of circuit the gradient can be evaluated in the same way as the original function. D circuit. Okay, so but just by using grad, just by using grad, KML grad, going to be evaluated. This circuit, I guess, of uh, derivatives and QML grad circuit what is arc num zero though the um sorry the function grad itself returns a function representing the derivative of the q of q node with respect to the argument specified in arc num in this case the function circuit takes on one argument params so we specify argnum equals zero because the argument has two elements. The return gradient is two dimensional. We can then evaluate this gradient function at any point in the parameter space. I don't get it though. Argnum zero. So Q no, Q no with respect to this to the argument specified in argnum. In this case, the function circuit takes on one argument. The function circuit is one argument. Mm. Parms and so we specify so we specify arc num equals zero because the argument has two elements. The return gradient is two dimensional. Uh, um, 
representing the derivative of the q naught with respect to the argument specified in arc num. I don't know what it is. A note on arguments. Quantum circuit functions being a restricted subset of Python functions can also make use of multiple positional arguments and keyword arguments. For example, we could have defined an above circuit function using two positional arguments instead of one array. Yeah, phi1, phi2. When we calculate the gradient for such a function, the usage of argnum will be slightly different. In this case, argnum0 will return the gradient with respect to only the first parameter, and argnum1 the gradient with respect to the second parameter. Ah, okay. But you can also say argnum uh, equals an array of 0, 1. Ah, okay. Or just do it like this. So that tells you, okay, what parameter is the, the, the one you're uh, doing the gradient on? Both or just one? Okay. And that returns an actual function, right? So you would kind of say, you do the same this circuit, but now instead of giving you the value, it's gonna give you the, uh, the gradient point 54, 0 0.12. So the gradient for both variables. And so this basically, this basically is telling us, this is telling us we should change those parameters somehow, right? So that we minimize the expectation value. Or what's the call? Yeah, I don't know. A note on the arguments who read these, okay. Optimization, now let's get into the optimization part. If using the default NumPy autograd interference uh, interface, Penilane provides uh, a collection of optimizers based on gradient descent. These optimizers accept the cost function. Ah, so we still got to compute the cost function and initial parameters and utilize Penilane's automatic differentiation to perform gradient descent. See the different optimizers in here. Uh, next, let's make use of Penilane's built in optimizers to optimize two circuit parameters. Uh, phi 1, phi 2, such that the qubit originally in state 0 is rotated to be in state 1. This is equivalent to measuring the polyzide expectation value of minus 1, since the state 1 is an eigenvector to polyzide. Blah, blah, blah. In other words, the optimization procedure will find weights that the result of the following rotation of the block sphere. So we need a cost function that basically tells us how far away are we from minus 1. That's what that's the point, I guess. By minimizing the cost function, the optimizer will determine the values of the circuit parameter. Okay, in this case, the outcome, since we know the polyzide version is bounded between minus 1 and 1, we can define a cost function as the output of the... Yeah, yeah. So basically, the cost function is just the output of the circuit because this is already the minimum value that we want to get, and we know it's not going to get lower than that. So we can define the cost function saying we want to, so we want to basically return, uh, so we want to, we want to optimize, we, we want to basically calculate how to change those parameters so that we minimize the expectation value, which is kind of minus one, that's what we want. Um, and we begin our optimization by just choosing some small values of phi and, th and, and, and phi one, phi two, right? So init params equals np array 0 0.011. I have no idea why this has to be an np array. What is, I'm, I'm such a noob with Python that I don't know. So what's the np array versus versus array? None, uh, it just probably has a bunch of... Uh, so memory performance uh, speed okay python list is numpy arrays what is the difference and uh, numpy arrays a grid of values uh, the number of dimensions in the rank of the, uh, 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 the python core library provides lists a list of python equivalents to an array but it's resizable and can contain elements of different types the common beginner question is what's the real difference there this is performance okay performance functionalities functionality a scipy and numpy have to my functions such as linear algebra operations built in that's cool okay where were we um so we start with these parameters and we print the cost in it params 0 0.99 so that's the high that's the high yeah that's almost like 
one being the eigenvalue, right? I guess if you, uh, so what if you say zero, zero, uh, should, this should just be literally one, right? Yeah. Point zero one zero point zero twelve. We can see that for these initial parameters, the cost function is close to one. Finally, we use an optimizer to update the circuit parameters for a hundred steps. We can use a built-in gradient descent optimizer class. Uh, so what is it doing? Uh, I'm just too lazy to code all that, I think. So initialize the optimizer, gradient descent optimizes step size 0 0.4, steps 100, parameters, init parameters, and for i in range steps, update the parameters. So, op so optim the optimizer one st uh, uh, dot step, and that's the cost, and those are the parameters. Um, and so, and then it prints that thing here. But, Oh, wait a second. So that does one step and it returns, does it return? Okay, it returns already the new parameters to apply, I guess. Right? The new parameters to apply. I think so. Cost. And then it Cost after step five. Cost after step blah, format i plus one. But then it prints the costs of those parameters and we've just overwritten them in here. Um, mm, 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 mm. So. Give me a second, I gotta pause for a second. Isn't this a mistake here actually? Shouldn't this be like next parameters, right? And uh, or or basically have like something like all params equals params and then and then here you just do uh, all params, right? Because um, Otherwise, you're getting like F the step. So every five steps, it's telling you the the cost. Mm. Or I plus one. Yeah, step one, okay. You know what I mean? Like, I think that should be this way. Because this overrides the parameters. So, 998, you see, so now we're getting these and... Because mm. if I, if I don't, if I, if I ignore these and I just print the cost for everything, I expect it in then. So, st like, if I if I use params, params, then I'm gonna get like something that's that's you know that's kind of after step two, I'd say, because here you've got like step one is the all parameters. So after you've done that, ah no, it's after the step. Okay, it's after the step. No, no, they're correct. Okay, never mind. This is correct. Because uh, this is the costs after the step. So you get the new parameters and you calculate what's the cost. That, that's good. We're good. Um, we're good. And so we get, after step 40, we're already at minus one. Mm, we can see that the optimizer converges after approximately 40 steps, substituting the blah, 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 blah. Uh, Exactly. So you mean. Uh, Ah, those are the parameters. Okay. Those are the angles. Those are really small, though. What? Oh, no, that's three point. That's pi. And that's 
almost nothing. Yeah, but that's basically like saying that's so small that it just might as well be zero, right? If you just rotate y, like you just do a y rotation of pi, then you get to one. But you see, that's interesting because but you, you would acquire you would acquire a a phase while doing so. And I'm just just uh, quirk. Let me just double check one thing. I'll go search. Can I just quirk dot html? So if I just do a um, a y rotation over pi. Yeah. Basically. And I change that by just pi. Oh no, that doesn't give me any okay, that's cool. That's good. Why would I think so though? That it gives me requires me a face? I don't know. If I do pi by half it does. No, it does. Wait a second. Am I just stupid? It's a Y. Okay, yeah. Ah, so it rotates this way. This way. So it does so by exactly. But if I do an, an X rotation, that's where. That's where if I do uh, pi divided by two, then we're getting these. Um, we're getting this phase in here of ninety degrees. If I do pi. Then, then we're also getting a phase in here, but we're really getting down to one. Now the question is, why hasn't the optimizer gone this way? It could have, right? It could have gone this way. I mean, because um, as I said, that's that's almost like saying print circuit zero and np pi. I think I can do it this way, right? That's minus one, yeah. Because that's a really small. It's like ten to the power of minus seventeen, and that's definitely pi. Um, and if I do print circuit and I do np pi and zero, we get the same. Okay. I'm curious. This is just this is just randomly it's just randomly so. I guess that depends on the optimizer you're using, right? Gradient descent optimizer. Or it depends on the on the initial parameters maybe. Because <laughs> Okay, maybe. What if we change these to, to two? And that's our initial state. So basically we're slightly rotating initially a little bit more here so the gradient descent gets fooled into going down that path and not the other path. That's my theory. Let's prove it. Let's see if it works. Oh yes, baby. It does. You see? Cool. What if I what if I what if the initial state is just the same? Which way will it go? Oh, that's interesting. It's half pi, kind of, right? Is it 1.57? Can I do it like what is it, one? How can I? Can I just do math with this? 1.57 times two. Three fourteen. Yeah, that's pi, definitely. Interesting. Okay, so the initial state, of course, influences the way you're gonna go, right? But I think that I think that's kind of I think that makes sense. Okay. Good stuff. Um we're done. Uh <laughs> okay. We're done. Um some optimizers suggest a DAC grad optimizer have internal hyperparameters that are stored in the optimizer instance. This can be reset using the reset method. Can you uh, continue on the next tutorial, Gaussian transformation, to see a similar example using continuous variable quantum nodes? Okay, no, but I'm not going to go the continuous variable way for now. Um, bu, 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 bu. So what have we seen in here, really? Um, so we've done basically something that's just gradient descent stuff. Uh, and if I compare it to what we did here, so this was a little bit different, right? Because here you had, but it was a similar concept. So you had basically also the expectation value thing. Um, but you had all the, uh, 
Okay, so what we're do what we're doing? We're constructing a we're constructing a circuit, right? Then we're parameterizing this circuit, and we're oh, that was the input, and then we're supposed to correct it, correct it so that it measures one. I think the expectation value. And so R Z R Y R X. So in this case we had three rotations, three rotation, like three like three parameters. <laughs> and there was a classical neural net that was doing what? Was it learning was it learning the um error model or something like this the expectation circuits observe that expectation layer the data set uh, input circuit definition so we were training that So we were training a normal neural network to do what? Learning to control a Kibin. Mm. Of minus one, we're getting to minus 0 0.95. Mm. Okay, but this was a bit more general because this was a, let's correct it, right? So this was a, we had a set of data that was like, okay, um, for for this set of beta angles, we're expecting a zero or we're expecting a one. Um, exactly. And uh, yeah, and so that, ex and, and, and then we had to correct accordingly based on what was the, ex based on what was the expectation value. <laughs> So, ba so this was a, an input for for the neural network in here. That was then, yeah. Okay, it's different examples. It's a bit of a different example, but I, I guess I guess in here in TensorFlow Quantum, you're more like I guess they focus more on showing you the interoper interoperability between like a classical neural network and a quantum circuit and stuff like that. Um, whereas whereas uh, the penny lay people focus more on showing you how to how to train a quantum function or a quantum circuit by just do, using gradi uh, gradial uh, gradient descent. I guess that's I guess that's it. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll leave it here uh, for now. There's a lot of stuff to explore in here. I just was uh, let's take a quick look. See what can what can we do next, though. Um, so we've got the basic qubit tutorial with the rotations and stuff. Na, 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 na. Uh, Gaussian transformation, plugins, and hybrid computation. Use quantum machine learning in a multi-device quantum algorithm. Multi-device quantum algorithm. Advanced usage. PyTorch and noisy devices. Is that Setting up the device, constructing a Q node, optimization, hybrid GPU, QPU optimization. Might be the same like quantum chemistry with penny lane. State preparation with PyTorch, cubitizing model with PyTorch, quantum generative adversarial networks with CERC plus TensorFlow. That would be interesting. Variational classifier function, no, 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 no. data reuploading, quantum natural gradient, QAOA for max cut. Wait a second, that was, uh, I've done this before. We could take a look at this as well. So we could take a look at these and 
compare it to the Kiski textbook as well, the way this is explained in there. Um, that could be that could be the next thing, because I think QIOA touches a bit of the entanglement thing, because you're creating you're creating you're adding control nodes in your in your in your ansatz. Um, other than that, maybe I should go take a look at some of the actual uh, like learning material. What is QML? Key concepts, demos, and videos. What have we got in here? So, quantum machine learning. Okay, so this is just a high-level explanation. Probably not super. Okay, so so key concepts: embedding, feature map, gradient, hybrid computation, variational circuit, mm, QML demos. Okay, so we were there already. Uh, and then we've got some videos in here. Q hack. Penny Lane, everything in the quantum kitchen scene, quantum machine learning at Rigetti, Penny Lane, deep learning, with near term quantum computing. Okay, but it's it's it kind of feels like it's mostly just variational stuff, right? Is is can one say that QML is just it can be just reduced to this right now uh, at the moment? Um, hmm. I don't know. We'll see, but multi. So advanced usage, Jacobians and keyword arguments. I don't know what can these be. And so I want something that I, I'd like to do something that basically is a bit more about um, uh, it touches a bit more about the entanglement stuff, allows me to explore a bit more about the state preparation with PyTorch. Um, entanglement, tangling all qubits. Follow three nodes, take our qubits, initial game. Okay, we'll see. Um, anyway, I think that's I think that's it. Uh, GitHub. So what do we have in GitHub? Uh, so this okay. So that's actually Penny Lane, the actual Penny Lane stuff. Our plugins, installation, getting started, contributing to Penny Lane, authors, support, license, introductory tutorials, QML tutorials. You guys can visit that definitely. I'll just put that into the uh, comments section of the video um, and go ahead and try to play with it. Uh, I don't know, we'll see. We'll probably do the QAOA one. What is data re uploading? Uh, uh, single qubit quantum circuit, which can be my arbitrary universal classifier, much like a single helium, expressing it sounds discussed with data re uploading. It is possible to load a single qubit with arbitrary dimensional data. And then use it as a universal classifier. Well, a single qubit with arbitrary dimensional data, and then use it as a universal classifier. Ah. Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, that can be interesting. That can definitely be also interesting. So I might probably do that as well. So using a single qubit as a classifier. Oh, that's pretty cool. Because, uh, yeah, I guess you can rotate. Uh, yeah. I guess you can rotate, and then if you add entanglement, you can go even go inside the block sphere. And uh, maybe, oh, yeah. But then it's not a single qubit anymore. But do you, have you got multiple qubits in here? Maybe we could do something like this. Exactly. Here we've got entanglement. Okay, let's take a look at this. Maybe that's um, that could be an interesting thing. So maybe I'll do this next instead of the instead of the uh, QAOA. So I'm gonna do the data re-uploading classifier. Next, um, and I'll also at the same time we'll probably do the MNIST classification. Uh, stay tuned for more, but it's uh, definitely, definitely interesting stuff. Yup. Then we're done here. We're done here today. Let's stop the recording.